My name is Frank Iacobucci. I'm an ex-law professor, uh, an ex-deputy minister of justice, an ex-chief justice of the federal court, an ex-justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. But there's no question, uh, at the time, uh, of being an academic, there was great excitement in the air. Uh, some of us felt that, well, the charter wouldn't make that much difference. Uh, life would go on and, and it wouldn't be as uh, revolutionary as predicted. Uh, there were criticisms about the judiciary, whether it was up to the task of taking on the charter and all of uh, the challenges that uh, that uh, uh, involved. Uh, there were, of course, great debates about whether this was uh, abandoning the English model of a the Westminster model of a parliamentary democracy, uh, and with, with it, whether this was, in the words of uh, many, uh, that this was too much of a transformation from a, const from a parliamentary supremacy to a constitutional supremacy. All of that was the buzz and, and much more uh, than, than what I just briefly mentioned. Uh, but it was exciting. Uh, to be uh, in the uh, academy at that at that time. Fortunately for me, I was uh, invited to go to uh, Ottawa in 1985, which was at the time of the delayed uh, introduction of Section 15 of the Charter, uh, to join the Justice Department as its deputy. And I saw in that period of time, albeit short, but nonetheless quite intensive, uh, a, a growing, if you like, elaboration of the Charter and what it meant in specific cases. Uh, we, we, we did have the early formulation by that Dix, Dixon Court, uh, which was extremely important uh, because this was, uh, these cases at the beginning, the Oaks and Big M Drug Mart, and all of those uh, were the, the major contours of the Charter. There was concern not to let the Charter fail the way the Bill of Rights failed, uh, to breathe life into the Charter and to give it substance and give it uh, not a literal meaning, but a, if you like, a uh, substantive meaning and a, and a uh, purposive uh, interpretation. Uh, and uh, that uh, took place, uh, I went to the court. Uh, after my service as deputy minister, but in being deputy minister, I saw the, the Morgan Tallow case, the, uh, the um, cases on Section 7, BC Motor Vehicle, uh, the case on Singh relating to uh, immigrants, uh, refugees rather, and what had to be enacted to comply with the Singh case. Uh, then I go to the federal court and saw, as a judge, uh, a truism that uh, Peter Russell, a political scientist from the University of Toronto, said that the Charter would represent the, uh, the judicialization of politics and the politicization of the judiciary. And by that he meant that the, the judiciary would be called into getting into areas of, of in inquiry and rulings that uh, were bordering on the, the, pol the political. I don't mean political in a partisan way. I mean political in the policy sense. That the, uh, courts would be determining, if you like, political policy outcomes in, uh, the, within the aegis of charter interpretation. And uh, there is a lot of truth to that. All of a sudden, the Supreme Court went from a, a North, uh, uh, an institution that really received very little academic attention, comparatively speaking, to now. Little academic attention, little media attention, uh, little over public attention. All of that has changed with the Charter. The Charter became uh, a focus for much debate, much uh, controversy, uh, much uh, dialogue, and, and, and indeed uh, uh, conversations. Uh, why? Well, because it was the, the courts were getting involved in what does freedom of expression mean? What does uh, uh, um, freedom of association mean? What does uh, equality mean? What does 
uh, life, liberty, and security of the person mean? Uh, what does Section 1 mean in terms of the qualifying uh, uh, language that says that the rights are subject to uh, reasonable limits under Section 1 of the Charter? Just uh, to paraphrase. Those were exciting times. Uh, those were, uh, I think, historically significant times. 